for the introduction, and I'm really, really excited to be here today for HacktivityCon. Uh, today, I'll be presenting on an interesting topic uh, titled uh, with hacking the evil VNC servers. And um, some of you guys might know about what VNC is all about. Some of you guys might be interested in vulnerability research. So um, I would just like to say that, here's my disclaimer, that today I'm really going to focus on uh, the boundary research aspect of it, so that what can you take away, can you can use in your own research, in your own bug bounty exploits. And one thing I've observed over time is that more and more people uh, are getting into vulnerability research as part of their bug bounty uh, uh, hacking, right? They want to look for zero days, they want to look for end days, and that's something that gives them an extra edge over just, uh, you know, as mentioned in the previous presentations, there might be recon, there might be fuzzing, and these are all essential skills that gives you the extra uh, edge over the other hunters. So that's what I'm really going to focus on today. I might not focus as much on the VNC uh, protocol itself, um, but rather the process, how I kind of started out, how I used this to learn about vulnerability research, and how you can also use these um, skills in your own research. Yeah, so some of you might have used VNC before. Sometimes you might need to connect to a remote desktop, right? You might have used a VNC client. You might have used our desktop. You might have used remote desktop. Uh, you might have used Putty on, uh, uh, on, on Windows. But all of you might have at one point or another needed to look into a remote desktop, right? Gives you the interactivity, gives you access to icons, your, your mouse, your keyboard. And this is something that a lot of people do all the time, especially in enterprise environments. So there are a lot of different protocols that enable you to get remote desktops. There's uh, VNC, which is uh, uh, just one of the open source protocols out there, but there's also RDP, as well as some of the more proprietary formats, such as Citrix, ESXi, um, and of course, Spice is also more of an open uh, format as well. But virtual network computing is really just one of these multiple protocols that gives you access to remote desktops. And it's really one of the earliest ones, I think maybe in the 1980s or even earlier than that, when it was first created, and that's why it's so popular today. And it's the, one of the simplest protocols out there as well. So for me, it was interesting because at that time, I think about almost a year ago now, I wanted to get started with practicing vulnerability research. And um, VNC stood out to me because I think a lot of people like to start with a file format. Last year, I presented HactivityCon with uh, the DBA, DBF file format that was able to find vulnerabilities in OpenOffice uh, as well as Microsoft Office. And this time, I was more interested in a network protocol. So this is why VNC kind of stood out to me. And why clients? So you know, when you look at a remote protocol, there are two sides of it. You can deal with the clients, or you can deal with the servers. And for me, I really was uh, more interested in clients because it's such an interesting attack vector. I think when you use a client and you connect to a server, there's an inherent trust boundary there. You, a lot of people don't really think about the servers you're connecting to. Uh, more people are concerned about the servers themselves, protecting the servers. But I think with clients, um, it's just you know, um, it, it can be quite an interesting attack vector, right? When you are trying to connect to a remote desktop, instead of launching cal calculator on your remote desktop, you get a uh, calculator popped on your desktop instead. So for me, it was just kind of an uh, interesting attack vector. And so with this kind of beginner starting mindset, I really wanted to have a simple plan of attack. And this is something I would kind of uh, go through and maybe show how you can also apply that in your vulnerability research. But the first was, of course, to read the specification. Uh, I think many speakers today have talked about how you should just read the documentation, read the specification. And from there, we dive in right into source code review. So you can use automated as well as manual code review. Um, for me, I like to use CodeQL for my automated code uh, review. And I'm going to just dive into the roles I wrote for this. And then you can start writing your Evo server. So you want to have kind of a harness to uh, run your test cases, your exploits. And then you can use that as also your testing ground as you build your exploit for the final uh, vulnerability. So how do you approach um, reading a specification? And um, I think for most protocols and most file formats, you're going to be pointed towards what's called an RFC, which is called a re request for comment. And this is kind of an open document that people can publish describing a protocol or a file format. And it often looks pretty intimidating, right? Um, and fortunately for VNC, it has a RFC called the Remote Frame Buffer Protocol. I think that's 6143. And it's actually relatively short. 
for an RFC. It's just 39 pages. Most RFCs, I think, are going to go up to hundreds of pages, 200 pages maybe. Um, but for 39 pages, it's actually really, really simple. And for me, when you're scanning through an RFC, I mean, I, I do recommend that you kind of read it all. But the things that you can look out for uh, in order of importance, the first thing that you should look out for is data structures, right? What are the structs? What are the uh, uh, formats that are going to be communicated in? And so for the uh, VNC, that was the pixel format data structure. And it was extremely simple. For the pixel format, it's just RGB. Um, you know, it's a 256 um, uh, kind of range. So it's really, really straightforward. Um, and you don't really need a lot of time on that. Once you have that down, you can kind of jump right into the communication protocols. So if you're dealing with a two-way format, uh, if you're dealing with just a file format, you might instead of a communication protocol, you might want to look into the parsing uh, protocol. But for this uh, specifically, I looked at the uh, client to server and the server to, to client uh, messages, and these tend to be in very uh, fixed um, um, uh, in a very fixed sequence. So you have to kind of understand all of this in order to construct uh, an exploitation uh, co uh, message. And the last thing is encodings. So encodings are interesting because they appear in both uh, remote uh, protocols as well as file formats. And they allow you to kind of uh, mutate your inputs and your outputs a little bit more so that you can kind of, uh, uh, kind of evade some of the most obvious um, bypasses or the most uh, obvious kind of protections that people put in. right? Because I think when you start with just the raw data structures, people are rather good at validating that. But once you add a bit of encoding onto it, uh, you can think of analog in terms of your XSSs when you're showing a bit of URL encoding or HTML encoding. Uh, these are ex extra ways that you can complicate the parsing of these formats or these protocols. And that's where a lot of these issues tend to take place. So that's the kind of three-step process I kind of recommend you to look at an RFC. You start with the data structures, and then you look at maybe the parsing or the communication protocols. And finally, you look at the encodings. So this gives you a bit of extra spice uh, that you can uh, start thinking about your um, test cases. So one thing that really stood out to me uh, after doing a lot of these RFCs is that um, a lot of them used to uh, try to adopt the tag length value scheme. And this is a very standard uh, three-part scheme that uh, protocols and data structures use. It's basically a tag, which is maybe the name. They can be like, oh, I'm a string or I'm a certain object, or I'm an integer, right? And then the next uh, part of the data is the length. It tells, it so, tells you how long am I. And the, then the, finally, you get to the value, which is the rest of the data uh, contained in this data structure. And this is an extremely simple scheme. Uh, I think it's used in stuff like Protobuf, uh, a lot of other remote protocols out there. But it's also one that's extremely prone to bugs, especially for beginner developers on their first time you know, implementing a protocol or an RFC. Uh, mostly because you know, when you trust the length implicitly, uh, you might actually fall victim to the rest of the value, which far exceeds the length. right? And that's how you get a buffer overflow. So uh, it might be seem really simple, very straightforward, but it's actually one of the most um, common beginner implementation bugs out there. And this is something that we could also see in VNC. So for VNC, they have something called a, a ZLIB, a ZLRE encoding. And this is what you also see with the packet that is being sent over here, uh, which is, of course, where one of the bugs could occur. So after kind of reading the documentation and you, the RFC, you, you should have a pretty good idea of what kind of exploit scenarios that you might have. Um, you might have looked at the uh, TLV structure and be like, OK, what happens if I send a length that's smaller than the actual length of the rest of the data or the value, right? Or you might be thinking, oh, there's this particular encoding that uses a Zlib encoding. Um, you know, there are a couple of well-known bugs with Zlib. If they're not careful about that, what can I do with that? So you might have these ideas in your mind. And one thing I do recommend at the start is just kind of do a sieve, right, using automated code review. And CodeQL is pretty good for that. You can use your favorite, um, um, uh, your favorite code review uh, tool, such as SamGrab as well. But I like uh, CodeQL as well just because of the taint tracking as well as the multiple file uh, parsing that it adds. So you start with that. You use a default query suite, maybe. Um, these don't tend to be great. Um, they tend to be very general. They might give you a lot of false positives. But once you kind of narrow down and given you an idea of the uh, problem areas, you can start using more custom rules that you've written yourself. And I'll give you an example of that later. But these custom rules, basically, you want to focus on tracing the source to sync. 
um, you want to trace where the user inputs come in, and you trace it all the way to possible uh, vulnerable outputs such as memcopy. And then you perform a bit of manual code review just to confirm your assumptions or just to uh, triage some of these stuff that might have come up with the automated code review. So um, for CoQL specifically, I really recommend the VS Code pl plugin. Um, basically, this is an integration that runs in VS Code itself. You can open up the uh, rest of the repository in VS Code, and then you run a specific rule. And the great thing about this is it allows you to really step through every single part of a Tain tracker. Because uh, what's going to happen is that it's going to open up a window by the side, and it gives you uh, little links to the rest of the code. You can open up exactly where the, the data is flowing throughout your entire code. And this makes it a lot easier to visualize it. Um, by default, I think CoQL works a lot better with um, servers. So they do output in CSV, they output in serif format, and this is just not very user friendly. It's not how a vulnerability researcher would typically operate uh, when you're doing a one-on-one -on -one code review. So if you're going to do just reviewing one piece of uh, uh, one project or one uh, uh, repository, uh, I really recommend that you use the VS Code plugin just because it integrates so well with uh, manual workflow, and that's kind of what you need when you're looking at a vulnerability. So yeah, start with the VS Code plugin. And OK, so this is a bit more, um, uh, it looks very scary, I think. One of the difficulties people have with CoQL is that the documentation is not really that great. And also, the, uh, the, the language itself, I think, is very, uh, very kind, of, kind of complex. There are a lot of hidden uh, classes that you might not be well documented. There might be a lot of things that you might not be aware of. So for beginners to CoQL and uh, virtual uh, and uh, vulnerability research especially, I really just recommend a simple source to sync taint tracking flow, right? What you do is you have this template, and you just have to specify um, your uh, uh, input sources. So for me, for our desktop, that was maybe RDP receive, and TCP receive, and the ISO receive functions. These are where they're going to accept the packets from an external attacker. And then you just put a very simple uh, sync, right? I, I put that as a second argument of memcopy. But I think uh, you can kind of draw in a bunch of other uh, things here. You can use stir, stir copy, a uh, bunch of other things. So as a beginner, you really don't want to overcomplicate things with uh, CoQL. I think it's very easy to get lost with CoQL. You want to start with a simple template like that. Um, you can use this uh, and then just kind of copy and paste your function names. Um, and this makes it a lot easier for you to just kind of zoom in on potential code flows that CoQL might not be able to uh, find a vulnerability in. But you, by just walking through this uh, data flow, you can use your manual code review to discover vulnerabilities. Yeah. So that's what I really want to emphasize, is that uh, CoQL helps you identify problem areas, but it doesn't really replace manual code review. Um, if you're using the kind of workflow I'm recommending, which is that you're using CodeQL as uh, source to sync tra uh, tracking, uh, you're not going to find vulnerabilities out of, out of this, right? It's just going to tell you exactly where the data is flowing, but it's not going to tell you if that data flow is vulnerable. So you're going to have to use your own um, uh, code review, manual code review skills to get there. And this is a, a really good case in point here, because when I was looking at um, tight VNC, uh, you know, VS Code uh, using CodeQL and VS Code pointed out a couple of things, but it wasn't able to detect this uh, vulnerability itself, where you can see a mem copy occurring in a for loop. And the mem copy itself is fine. Uh, I think the, the, the buffer length is, is always validated, it's always going to match up with the uh, destination buffer, but it's happening in a for loop where the number of iterations is actually controlled by an attacker, right? And that's where the problem happens. So I think for CoQL itself, they do have general suites, uh, query suites. They're able to pick up maybe a, a for loop controlled by an attacker. But it's not going to tell you exactly that, oh, this is greater than the, uh, the buffer that's allocated itself. So you're going to have to kind of dive in and verify this manually, right? So uh, once again, yeah, CoQL is great. I think uh, a lot of you might be interested. You might have read blog posts about it. Uh, my kind of takeaway from CoQL is that it's useful as a sieve, as useful as kind of a filter to funnel down to problem areas, and from there you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to do the rest of the work yourself. So um, great tool, just know your tools and know what they're good for. Yeah, so I think it's great that uh, Tom spoke about fuzzing earlier. <laughs> so when I was doing research uh, on VNC itself, uh, I think that was a kind of a conscious decision not to really, uh, so some of my colleagues actually did a bit of fuzzing with AFL. Um, but uh, given the kind of code bases we're dealing with, uh, VNC is a very simple protocol. The code bases are actually really small. 
uh, we decided really not to invest too much time in fuzzing. Um, and of course, this is kind of a design decision you're going to have to make as well, right? Uh, whether something can be passed easily with just pure manual code review, or if you're going to need a bit more help because it's such a huge code base. And in our case, because we're dealing with pretty much simple open source libraries and simple open source clients, uh, there's not much fuzzing that was needed. Um, we might have done a bit of dumb fuzzing, we might have done a bit of AFL because we can build the uh, binaries ourselves. But writing an end-to-end -end harness, especially for clients, is really, really difficult. Uh, well, not difficult, but just um, really um, annoying. Because when you're dealing with clients, uh, what you're going to need to do end-to-end -end is that you're going to have to start the handshake with the server, and then the server's going to have to reply with your poison input. Whereas for a server, you can just keep listening, and then you can send an input any time. Um, of course, you can also write a kind of a more uh, uh, targeted harness for specific functions and all that. But really, when it comes to uh, uh, vulnerability research, I think, uh, especially when you're starting out, you really want to do an end-to-end -end thing, just so that you don't confuse yourself with uh, specific functions that might not be vulnerable, or specific code flows in the code that don't really apply to an attacker's uh, perspective. Yeah, so once I kind of had this uh, workflow, uh, I decided to start using an open source implementations of uh, servers, you know, to craft my Evo server, to run some of my test cases. And um, if you're starting out, I don't recommend just taking an uh, open source server wholesale and trying to write your test cases in that, because it's really difficult to kind of build, uh, get these built or to get these running. Uh, what I do recommend is that you use a Python script uh, just to quickly mock up some of these uh, exploit scenarios. Uh, you can refer to open source snippets, of course, but really, you, what you really want to do is just make sure that you have a Python script that you can quickly uh, start and stop, that you can quickly run your test cases, and also that you can quickly modify. So what you can see here in the background is that uh, I was really just sending the raw bytes themselves, and this is something that you can do as well. I don't recommend that you write a very uh, complicated class um, or you over-engineer it. Uh, you should just be dealing with raw bytes at this point. And this is really what we did here. Um, and based on the code that we saw that might be vulnerable, we decided to write a few uh, test cases in Python. And that's how we were able to uh, validate these exploits. And then, of course, you're going to have to use a debugger. So um, I think, especially when you're starting out, I think debuggers can be really um, intimidating. But for Windows, I think you can just use WinDBG. That's a really straightforward debugger. And you don't really need a lot of expertise in WinDBG, especially at this level. What you really need to do is just to confirm where the, uh, where the buffer overflow happens. Um, and in this case, this was in the SEH, the error handler. Let's see if this is on the screen. OK. There we go. So what you see here is basically me uh, starting this crash on tight VNC. Oh, there we go. Okay, I don't think it's going to play the video. Um, but um, basically, what, you, what you're supposed to see here is basically me uh, starting the uh, the program, the client in type VNC with WinDBG, and it's going to instrument that, it's going to start debugging that, and then I'm going to start the Evo server that I've written in Python, and I'm going to use the uh, type VNC to connect to the Evo server, and that's going to lead to the crash. And um, if you look at the previous uh, image there, uh, at the end of the day, what's going to happen is that you're going to kind of step through the uh, crash, and you're going to end up at an instruction that's just 414141, and that's when you can confirm that you have successfully overwritten the uh, return pointer or the SEH handler, and you've gotten to uh, control flow. Uh, and that's what you really want to do. So from there, you can kind of use that to uh, write the rest of your exploit. For me, I was kind of, you know, I was kind of taking a break at that point because there were so many of these um, implementations we were testing. It was kind of a broad range of uh, libraries and clients. But this was enough to move on with disclosure. And as a starting vulnerability researcher, I think disclosure itself is an art, right? We had a talk earlier today talking about how to write a good report. I think when it comes to writing disclosures, you kind of have to be a bit sensitive with that. Um, and what was pretty interesting is that we, so we found something in tight VNC, and we had to wait for them to patch it. Um, they were fairly uh, good about that. Uh, I think what really helped with us is that we uh, pointed out the root cause, and this is where your manual code review is going to go really helpful because the devs are going to ask, you know, what, what do I do? What do I patch? And it, once you kind of give them the code snippet that's vulnerable, they're kind of pretty straightforward with that. 
uh, one funny thing that happened was that we did find a vulnerability in libvnc, and um, it was actually a bug clash. So actually, CrowdStrike was looking at it two weeks earlier, and I have no idea what they're doing uh, working on VNC clients, but they found a bug in that as well. Um, so for for you at this point, you can kind of decide what you want to do with your bug, right? Uh, because you can uh, you found the exploit, you have found the root cause, and really for open source projects, I think there are a lot of um, even there's a lot of new uh, initiatives in creating bounties there. You can look for that, or you can just disclose that in the GitHub security uh, advisory, and both ways are able to get you the patch. Yeah, so I think this is kind of a very simple workflow that I've put out today. Um, there was a great blog post re recently written by Retroid uh, about the uh, specific ROM format, and it was really kind of uh, covered a lot of the things I've talked about today, where if you want to start with VonB research, you really want to start with the documentation. You want to read the specs. And once you've read the specification, you kind of ask yourself, as a developer, where would I make a mistake? And then you can kind of verify or you can look into the code to check if those mistakes happen. So I think after kind of stepping through this uh, beginner boundary researcher workflow, um, this is kind of what I would recommend to you, right? You want to start with reading a specification, and then you can do a bit of source code review through automated code source code review, and then using that as a filter for manual code review. And then you move on to writing your Evo server. So that could be your exploit script or your, um, uh, your test cases. And once you run these test cases, you can also add a bit of fuzzing to it. Um, so for fuzzing, especially I think when you're first starting out, you might want to start with dumb fuzzes. So open source stuff like uh, the uh, uh, Fuskowski by NCS group, as well as uh, Bufas, a couple of these uh, open source uh, dumb fuzzes are actually pretty useful. And I think GitLab uh, recently open sourced Peach Fuzzer as well. But if you want to get a bit more involved, you want to learn and go in a bit deeper into fuzzes, I do recommend AFL. Uh, that's really uh, a pretty, uh, I think it's a pretty solid implementation, pretty beginner friendly, um, at least it, when you're talking about fuzzing. So that might be something that you can work with. And of course, once you've done your fuzzing, you're going to go with your disclosure or your bug bounty report. So yeah, I think uh, this is just a really straightforward uh, vulnerability research workflow. I hope this has kind of given you some ideas about what you want to take away, uh, where you want to apply these. Uh, what I did with my VNC clients was kind of what I've talked about today. But you know, we can think about how you can apply that, especially to uh, open source uh, tools or frameworks that are being used in your bug bounty targets. And uh, hopefully, this gives you kind of a stepping stone to start your vulnerability research journey. Thank you. <laughs>